we get charismatic leaders who uh, inspire a great deal of enthusiasm and and zealotry from their followers, and and these followers end up spinning tales about events that didn't actually occur. For any worldview, you could say, why do people believe what they do? Uh, were they raised that way? Uh, you know, were they convinced that way? But I, I, I want to be careful that uh, we don't commit the genetic fallacy. Um, you know, uh, it, it it's not a matter of why you come to believe something. The, the more important question is what you believe is what you believe true. Hello and welcome to Unbelievable, the show that gets Christians and non-Christians talking about the subjects that matter to all of us. I am your host, Andy Kind. And today we are back on an old topic that never really gets old. We are looking at the resurrection of Jesus. Did it really happen? It's the central claim of Christianity. I'm delighted to be hosting this one because it's a topic that has fascinated me for some time. And over the years on Unbelievable, we've had many debates on this topic, but this is sure to be a good one. Make sure to rate and review the podcast on whatever platform that you're watching or listening to it on. And today with me are my guests, a theologian and a philosopher, and I'm going to introduce those two men to you very soon. They have very different views, opposing views, but they are friends across the divide. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you Dr. Mike Lacona and Dr. Larry Shapiro. Mike Lacona has a PhD in New Testament from the University of Pretoria. He completed all requirements with distinction and the highest marks. He is a frequent speaker on university campuses, churches, Christian groups, retreats, and frequently debates, and has appeared as a guest on dozens of radio and television programs. He is a member of the Evangelical Theological and Philosophical Societies, the Institute for Biblical Research, the Society of Biblical Literature, and the prestigious Studiatorium Novo Testamenti Societis. Easy for you to say. Mike is Professor of New Testament Studies at Houston Christian University and the president of Risen Jesus. Opposite Mike is Dr. Larry Shapiro, Berent Ench Professor of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He also got his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Larry's research spans philosophy of mind and philosophy of psychology. His books, The Mind Incarnate and The Multiple Realization Book, as well as articles in the Journal of Philosophy, Philosophy of Science, and the Philosophy and Phenomenological Research examine these issues. He's published numerous articles and received the American Philosophical Association's Joseph B. Gitler Award for Best Book in Philosophy of the Social Sciences in 2013. It's now in its second edition. His recent interest in philosophy of religion resulted in The Miracle Myth, Why Belief in the Resurrection and the Supernatural is Unjustified. So, those are my two guests. Welcome to you both. Thank Thank you. you, Thanks for having us. It's to have you here. So, uh, sterling and sparkling CVs for both of you. As you can see, uh, viewer or listener, we haven't just dragged these men in off the street. They know what they're talking about. So we want to talk about the resurrection. First question, a sort of soft open, if you like. Um, Mike, have you always believed in the resurrection of Jesus separate from your historical research in New Testament studies? Um, Yes. Uh, It wasn't my research on the resurrection of Jesus that convinced me that Jesus was raised and that I was a non-believer beforehand. But I would say it's the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus um, that has persuaded me to remain a Christian. I don't know that I would be a Christian today if I didn't think the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus was there. And when I was doing my doctoral research on this topic, There were only a few people, my wife, my doctoral supervisor, Jan van der Vaat, uh, William Lane Craig, Gary Habermas, they knew I was really questioning my faith and could have gone either way. Wow, that's fantastic. And um, well, not fantastic that you could have gone either way, but fantastic that you're here and stronger for it. Uh, Larry, sort of same question to you, flipped. Have you always disbelieved or seen the uh, resurrection as unjustified before you got into your area of research and expertise? Uh, well, my, my background is a, um, a secular Jewish raising. And, and so um, even if I had been religious, it, it wouldn't, because it wouldn't be my, my belief in the resurrection that um, 
drove my religious convictions. I would have been in, in the Jewish faith. But um, I always thought of the resurrection as on par with other purported biblical miracles, um, which which struck struck me as too fantastic to to have actually occurred. So, for instance, um, it's 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 hard to believe that Noah actually filled an ark with uh, two two members of of all the millions of species on Earth, and it's it's hard to believe that that uh, Moses actually parted the Red Sea. And I, I regarded these claims because of their their on the face and probability as requiring a, a, a stupendous amount of evidence in order to justify them. And I, I, I didn't see that evidence. And Mike, just on that, should we distinguish the genres of Old Testament and New Testament books? Should we be seeing the claims for the resurrection on the same level as Noah's Ark or something like that? Or are there, are they different styles of writing? Uh, that's a fair question, Andy. I, I don't know how quite quite how to answer that. Um, some of my uh, evangelical friends who are Old Testament scholars, I've spoken with them on a couple of times asking them some questions about the Old Testament. And a lot of times they'll just say, Mike, I don't know. Um, and they'll say, you don't know how fortunate you are as a New Testament scholar. You have a whole lot more data to work with than we do with the Old Testament. Um, they're not even certain of, 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 you know, confident of certain genres to be able to distinguish them. So, for example, William Lane Craig has recently written a book on the historic, the quest for the historical Adam, in which he's he labels the first, uh, I think, eleven or twelve chapters of Genesis as mytho history. So he says that is the intended genre of that. I know some are going to disagree with that, but um, uh, I, I think it's a, a more difficult thing when we come to the Old Testament. When you come to the New Testament, the majority of New Testament critics today do agree that the Gospels are either of the genre of Greco-Roman biography or that they share a whole lot in common with that genre. And that was far more historical in nature. Uh, we can know more about that genre than we can some of the Old Testament ones. Looking then at the New Testament, because that's what we're sort of uh, zoning in on, how do we begin to evaluate the historical reliability of these ancient texts. Could you start to unpack how where we begin with that? Yeah, well, I think you have to come up with criteria and an understanding of what historical reliability is first. And um, ancient uh, historical literature and biography in particular um, had some different literary conventions and objectives than we have today. They were more flexible with the details. Um, and that's not I mean, this is all ancient biography. Um, so uh, I would define historically reliable with ancient literature to say that uh, it gives us an essentially faithful representation of what occurred, or you could say uh, an accurate gist of what occurred. Um, but they were not so much concerned with the precise details as we are today. In, in modern biography, uh, you don't want, uh, they don't shoot for precision with uh, what you want in a transcript of a legal deposition, but uh, it's a lot closer to that than they were in antiquity. So I think for a criteria, you want to know, um, uh, were they writing in a genre that intended to report uh, accurate history? Did they choose their sources judiciously? Did they use those sources responsibly? Do we have good reasons to think that the sources they used uh, were capable of reporting um, accurate history. Um, do a lot of the things, a lot of things reported in that particular document, uh, do we have good reasons to think that a, a number of the things reported are true and that uh, only a very small percentage of things are reasonable candidates for being false? So if you apply these criteria, they could apply to the Gospels, they could apply to Suetonius's lives of the 12 Caesars, Plutarch's lives, uh, Sallust's war with Catiline, Tacitus's Annals of Rome, whatever. And I think that's what you got to look for, for these uh, reliability of ancient sources. So Larry, Mike, they're taking the historian's approach, looking at explanatory power, explanatory scope, plausibility. Um, how would a philosopher begin to try and analyze the ancient texts? Presumably there's a, there's a difference, but how would... How would a philosopher go about that? 
Um, as as I'm, a, I'm approaching uh, the, the question about uh, Jesus' resurrection from the perspective of, of a philosopher of science, a, a philosopher of science is expert in thinking about the relationship between data, what Mike was calling data, or or what I just call evidence more colloquially, uh, and and the hypotheses that the the data or evidence support supports. And I, I actually wanted to begin my portion of the discussion uh, in, in a conversation with Mike to see uh, just the extent to which we might agree on things before we start disagreeing. So I, I have a, a number of, well, I've got four scenarios that I wanted to run past Mike to get his opinion of these things. So it, it, is that okay with you, Andy? Oh, make yourself at home, Larry. Absolutely. Go for it. Okay. So I'm going to ask you some questions about four different scenarios, Mike, and I, I think we're going to find ourselves largely in agreement, but 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 then I'll try to draw some lessons from these l- later on about the, the the resurrection claim. So here's here's the first scenario: you leave your house one morning and you find a a, a dead mouse on your stoop, and um, you now have to do what a philosopher calls an inference to the best explanation. The 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 dead mouses are the phenomenon that we want to explain. And we didn't see what caused the mouse to die, so we have to make a kind of inference about what the cause of the mouse's death was. Uh, and and so what we'll do is we'll entertain various hypotheses that would explain the mouse's death. And when you draw an inference to the best explanation, you're, you're trying to select among your different explanations, your different hypotheses, and uh, you choose the best and reject the ones not as good. So 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 here are three hypotheses. And uh, I want to see if we agree on which ones we might accept and reject. So one is that a, a cat had killed a mouse. One is that a, a hawk had killed a mouse and accidentally dropped it. And the, the third is that an alien spacecraft shot the mouse. Uh, so so let's just see if we're on the same page about which explanations are, are better than which. Which do you like, Mike? Oh, well, certainly uh, I would go with the cat first, the hawk second, and the space aliens third. Okay, and, and what is it about the space aliens that leads you to put it so low? Um, well, I I would say I I don't believe that there are space aliens, uh, given what we know from science. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I've spoken to uh, Hugh Ross, and he's an, ast- uh, an astrophysicist. He says, well, the closest planet capable of even supporting intelligent life would be 23,000 light years away. And there's just no way they could make a trip here. Even going at the speed of light, which is impossible, he said it would take 23,000 years. No one could live that long. And you got all kinds of problems like uh, radiation and space debris that would just be prohibitive of it. So um, yeah, so that's why I would I would go with that last. Okay, great. And I, I love that answer because it, it makes a point that I w- was interested in making, which is that when you're selecting among your hypotheses, you have a bunch of assumptions that go along with that hypothesis. So, so your your answer made clear that if we think of space aliens, we we have to know something about the distance a space alien would have to travel, the amount of time it would take them to travel, uh, and and these other sorts of things. All of which, notice, are are confirmable on their own. We 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 can establish things like the distance of these planets and the time it would take to 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 travel. Next, next, next question. If, if if you'll oblige me further, I, I I just read an interesting article about an historian named Marion Gibson who wrote a bunch of books about witches. And uh, in in 1532, the the, the Holy Roman Empire uh, established this law called the Constitutio Criminalis Carolina, which um, uh, established the law for prosecuting prosecuting witches and. In, in the 16th century, in, in Germany alone, 25,000 women were tortured and executed um, because of their because of the charges of witchcraft against them. So, so, well, first, do you think they were witches? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I've never. I, I'm unfamiliar with what you're talking about. I mean, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I would probably be disinclined to believe that all of them were okay but maybe some of them were you think perhaps yeah 
Oh, oh, okay. I wasn't expecting well, that answer. Define what you mean by which, too, please. Uh, well, I, I guess someone who's able to marshal supernatural powers for evil purposes. Yeah, yeah. I, I do believe that such exist. Okay. Um, so why, why do you think that... Um, okay, well, let, let me move on to my next question. Um, this, I, I know your answer because we've talked about this uh, once, but there, there are now about 16 to 17 million people on Earth who believe that um, Joseph Smith uh, uncovered some gold tablets that the uh, Moroni, the, the son of the Prophet Mormon, had, had hidden. And this tells the story of the uh, Jaredites uh, fleeing the Tower of Babel and, and settling in the Americas, and of, of Jesus later visiting them in the Americas. And uh, of of the um, uh, Lamanites and then and the Nephites. Uh, and uh, first question then is: Do do you believe this uh, origin story of the the Mormon faith? No. Okay. And and the reason being is because it lacks archaeological evidence for it. Um, in, in fact, there's evidence against it, such as if that were true, that they came over from Israel and settled here in North or Central America that and, and uh, interbred with the natives, there would be Semitic uh, traces of Semitic DNA within those. And yet studies that have been done from Alaska all the way down to the tip of South America have shown there's no traces even within the native tribes. Um, we would expect all sorts of things like... Um, when the Book of Mormon talks about um, uh, they wrote in Hebrew and Reformed Egyptian, you would find some sort of trace of that, like in uh, Ostraca, you know, uh, written on broken pieces of pottery or stones or something. And there's just nothing, nothing at all that would suggest that these peoples existed here. People existed at that time, but there's nothing to specifically tie them to the peoples of the Book of Mormon. Can yeah. I jump in there quickly? Sorry, Larry, we can loop back, obviously, to what you're saying, but just on that, Mike, then, um, what are the key sources that we use for evaluating the historicity of the resurrection claims? What are the key sources that we're looking at here? Um, well, I, my primary source, I think the best source would be Paul, um, because he is was a non-believer, a, a Jewish Pharisee at the time who was out persecuting Christians. Um that uh, then he claimed to have an experience that he interpreted, at least, as an appearance of the risen Jesus to him, and it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. So I, I think he's probably our best source. And then I would look at the Gospels. Um, uh, Mark, our early church tradition, is that Mark's reporting what he heard from Peter, the lead apostle, one of Jesus' three closest disciples. Um and there's good reason, even critical scholars today, the, the majority of critical New Testament scholars writing since in English since 1965, uh, think the reasons for accepting that testimony are good. Um, it, you got John that although the majority of today's critical scholars do not think uh, that the traditional authorship of John is correct, that it was John, the son of Zebedee, they still think that the author was either one of Jesus' minor disciples who had been with him or that the author's primary source was one of Jesus' disciples. So, um, I mean, we could go on, but um, I think the, the Gospels and the writings of Paul are probably the best that we have. Okay. We've got about three minutes before the first break. Larry, I'll let you go back to uh, um, questioning yeah. Mike mm -hmm. according to your hypothesis. Okay. So just one more question about the Mormons. I, I agree with you that the evidence uh, for the events that are described in the Book of Mormon is is, is too weak to justify the sorts of beliefs that Mormons hold. But why do, why do you think that almost 17 million people believe it? Um, I think by and large, most of them are raised that way or they have just been convinced uh, that that way. Um, yeah, I, but I just don't think that uh, the evidence is there to support the truth of what they believe. I mean, the same thing could be said of, of any worldview, actually. Oh, I'm surprised to hear you say that because Christianity is a world beer. Okay. Uh, well, let me clarify that then. Okay. Thanks for, for saying that. So that came out wrong for me. Um, I, uh, but I, I think that 
I, I guess what I'm saying is we could, um, for any worldview, you could say, why do people believe what they do? Uh, were they raised that way? Uh, you know, were they convinced that way? But I, I, I want to be careful that uh, we don't commit the genetic fallacy. Um, you know, uh, it, it it's not a matter of why you come to believe something. The, the more important question is what you believe is what you believe true. Yeah, good. Final case. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether this is as true in England as it is in the United States, but in the, in the United States, 17% of people believe and 37% are not sure whether um, there's a, a group of satanic worshiping pedophiles who are running the, the, the government, the media, and our financial institutions. This is a group known in the States as, as QAnon. Um, so, so my, my own view is that, uh, QAnon is just a, a conspiracy theory and there, there's no evidence for, um, for the sorts of claims they're making. I'm, I'm not going to ask Mike whether he believes the claims of QAnon. Um, but, but I, but I have the same question I did about Mormons. Why, why do you think almost half of Americans are willing to accept the claim that, that the government and the media and the financial institutions are being run by a, a, a satanic ring of, of pedophiles. I, I don't know. And I mean, I'll, I'll be forthright. I, I really don't know anything about QAnon. I've heard a lot about it. Well, not a lot about it. I know Trump was accused of uh, being supportive of them or refused to condemn them. And I, I really just don't know what QAnon believe. I've, I've never looked into it. Um, yeah, in, in terms of, yeah, I just don't know. Are we getting here, Larry? Are we getting here at, at the idea that a belief can be true, but unjustified and equally it, a, belief, a belief can be false, but you might be justified in believing that. Is that, is that sort of where we're heading with this? No, where we're heading with this is that, um, what, what the resurrection presents to us are um, well, what 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 the Gospels and Paul present to us are uh, a description of an event, and uh, what are, what our evidence is just like the, the the mouse on the doorstep. What what our evidence is are these accounts from from Paul and, and from the authors of the Gospels, and we have we view these as as evidence, and so we have to ask ourselves now, what's the best explanation? What's the inference? The best explanation that would account for this kind of evidence. And uh, my idea is that one hypothesis is that Jesus did really rise from the dead, and that would explain why we've got these accounts from Paul in the Gospels. But I can think of numerous other kinds of hypotheses that seem to me better than the Jesus rising hypothesis. And uh, we know from thinking about the uh, sheer numbers of people who believe in QAnon and believe in the uh, doctrines of the Church of Latter-day Saints, that people are often um, uh, led to believe things that are, are, are simply false. That, that, that's where I'd like to go with the, the examples that I've been discussing. That's great. Mike, how would you like to respond to that? Oh, I agree with him entirely. We have to use arguments of inference to the best explanation. And I would say when you do that with the resurrection, uh, the question of what happened to Jesus, the resurrection hypothesis uh, is far superior to any of the alternative uh, hypotheses. And so, yeah, I'd be happy to discuss those with Larry and hear what he has to say in terms of what he thinks is the better hypothesis. And then we can compare that with the resurrection hypothesis. And we're, we're going to do that. We'll certainly do that and look at um, the resurrection hypothesis and the uh, alternate explanations in part two. Finally, Mike, before we go to our break, how do we, can we reconcile uh, discrepancies between the differing accounts of the resurrection? And if we need to try and reconcile seeming discrepancies, how does that impact our confidence in the resurrection's historicity? Well, I, first of all, I would say that um, a number of skeptics will make a whole lot out of discrepancies within the Gospels, but 
uh, they need to read the rest of ancient literature as well. They need to read Plutarch's lives. And uh, I mean, just look at uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar and read how it's reported by Appian, Cicero, Dio, Livy, Nicolaus, Plutarch, Suetonius, and Valius. Um, there's lots of discrepancies in, in those accounts of what happened um, that I could name. But they're all in the peripheral details, and it doesn't change the essence or you know the gist of, of what happened that day. Was it D. Brutus Albinus who uh, re restrained um, Antony outside of the theater so that he wouldn't intervene with the assassination, or or, or was it? Um, um, oh, I forgot who the other one was. He was one of the three cons the major conspirators. Um, so it. it it doesn't really change things. And it's, that's not just unique to the assassination of Caesar. It's in many different accounts. And in fact, even the way Plutarch tells the same uh, story in different biographies, they have discrepancies. Although you're talking about the same author using the same sources reporting the same event. Again, ancient biographers weren't so concerned with reporting uh, with the same kind of precision. We uh, are in modern biography. So, um, you know, that's one thing. And I, I would uh, look at it and say, you know, there were various compositional devices that were used by ancient biographers and historians. They were supposed to use them, as we find uh, taught in the compositional textbooks by Theon, Hermogenes and others, uh, Quintilian. And so we find that a, a lot of what's going on for the dis so-called discrepancies are a result of them applying these compositional devices that they were prescribed to do. Well, we'll get straight back to that after the break. We are going to take a break now. And uh, today on Unbelievable, the question is, did it really happen, the resurrection of Jesus? I've been joined by two academics, Dr. Mike Lacona and Dr. Larry Shapiro. And my goodness, it's been a meaty one so far. We've had some history. We've had some philosophy. We've had some science. And right at the center, a murder mystery. Who killed the poor little mouse, and uh, as I'll tell Larry in the break, I have my own hypothesis, which is that he died of a broken heart. But that's not really for that's a different episode, and we'll need a detective for that. But you are uh, watching or listening to Unbelievable. We are going to have a quick break. Why don't you get in touch with us and let us know what you think? How did the mouse die? You let us know, and uh, who's persuading you so far? Email us unbelievable at premier.org.uk or get in touch via social media on x formerly known as twitter we are at unbelievable fe at premier unbelievable for instagram or facebook is facebook.com forward slash premier unbelievable and obviously let us know what you think in the comments we'll be back very shortly after this quick break We are launching a brand new course which helps us to consider the evidence and questions around the birth of Jesus. It's called Did It Really Happen? The Birth of Jesus. Why not sign up for the course or gift it to a friend? Find out more at premierunbelievable.com. Welcome back to part two of this unbelievable episode with me, your host, Andy Kind. And today we are looking at the resurrection of Jesus, did it happen? And are there alternative explanations? I've been joined by Dr. Mike Lacona and Dr. Larry Shapiro, and we're having a fantastic conversation so far. Two friends with wildly opposing views, but talking about it in a very amenable and gentlemanly way. And that's what we want from you in the comments as well. Um, in this part, we're going to give Mike some chance to lay out the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and then we'll give Larry chance to pick that apart and uh, and have at it so mike why don't you kick off this second half by laying out as succinctly as possible um some evidence for the resurrection of jesus sure uh, so i i think we can make a simple case for the resurrection of jesus by looking at two things number one facts and number two evidence uh, i'm sorry method facts and method so in terms of the facts, you know, I'm going to be, as a Christian, I'm probably going to be more inclined to accept things in the New Testament literature uh, than Larry will, and he will be more disinclined to accept things than, than I will. Um, certainly our worldviews, our biases are going to be in play. So in, in order to attempt to minimize the 
uh, possibility of our horizons, our worldviews, uh, compromising the integrity of investigation. Uh, I like what his, uh, what um, Paula Fredrickson of Boston University, a Jewish, non-believing New Testament scholar, has said. You look first at the historical bedrock, facts past doubting. In other words, you want to look at 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 facts that are so strongly supported by the data that hardly anyone doubts them. Um, it doesn't mean that you accept these things because scholars agree on them, but it's to say that the supporting data for these things is so strong that virtually all scholars agree on them. So um, that would be things such as Jesus died by crucifixion, uh, that shortly after his death, a number of his followers came to have experiences that they interpreted as appearances of the risen Jesus to them. Um, I would say that uh, not quite 100% like the others, but um, maybe about 80, 85% would say that some of these experiences occurred in group settings. And then um, we, there's a guy named Paul who was a Jewish Pharisee. Um, so he's very zealous, very serious about his Jewish faith. And um, he was out persecuting Christians because he believed it was a harmful cult. Um, and then in the midst of his activities, he had an experience that he also interpreted as an appearance of the risen Jesus to him. And it did transform his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most um, able defenders. So those would be the facts that are either virtually undisputed or that a very large majority of scholars grant as facts. So then, as Larry said, which you, you go to the, the next step, and that's method. Um, you formulate hypotheses to account for those facts, and the, you use arguments of inference to the best explanation. Um, and that involves criteria such as explanatory scope. Um, does it in, include the majority of those facts? Uh, explanatory power. Given the truth of that hypothesis, what do we expect? And then what do we get in comparison? Um, less ad hoc. Uh, you want to use the least amount of speculation as possible. And then fourth, plausibility. Given the truth, our background knowledge, that is, um, you know, how, how does this hypothesis compare with our background knowledge? Um, is it compatible with it? So these are the four main criteria you would use for assessing hypotheses. And then the hypothesis that best explains these things is regarded as what probably, tr uh, probably occurred. That's how arguments of best inference to the best explanation work. And then when you do this, the resurrection hypothesis, I believe, comes out on top every time. It certainly explains all of the facts. It does so without forcing them to fit. And it's like, given the truth of the resurrection, if it actually occurred, what you expect is pretty much what you get. It's not ad hoc. The only thing that you would say yeah, that could be ad hoc is you've got to bring God into the equation. But for me as a historian, I don't do that. What I do is I say, I'm not going to presuppose God exists. I'm not going to a priori exclude him. Um, I'm just going to look at the data, form hypothesis, and say, does it look like this event actually occurred? Um, and, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't have to bring God into it. I just have to be open to his existence. And then, um, in fact, I don't, for the resurrection of Jesus, I don't even have to say God did it. I could say it was an alien in a parallel universe, uh, who, who did this as a PhD experiment to, and to, to see if he could persuade a bunch of people to believe it, yeah. uh, that he came back to life. Um, you know, uh, so I don't even have to say God did it. Now, of course, as a Christian, I think it was God. I think that's the best explanation. I think most people would say if Jesus rose, it was the best explanation. But as a historian, I don't have to to uh, to arrive at the cause. And then finally, plausibility. Well, if God doesn't exist, then the resurrection becomes extremely implausible, and I would have to reject it, uh, despite the evident how, how much evidence that there would be. But if God exists, well, then the probability of the resurrection becomes one. Um, even Larry himself acknowledges this in his book on myth or miracles, that if God exists, the probability of the resurrection becomes one. So I, I don't think that it's fair to presuppose his existence or operate or exclude it. Uh, you just have to do your 
best at letting the facts speak for themselves and um, allow them to challenge a worldview. If not, then you end up umpiring with your worldview and the danger in that is manifest. That philosophy corrupts good history. Thanks, Mike. Well, um, we will now allow Larry to swoop down like a hawk to devour the mouse of Mike's oh. arguments. Uh, come on, Larry. We know, obviously, that you disagree with Mike's conclusion. Are you at least happy with the method? Uh, ab absolutely. Mike is 100% um, correct that we're relying on this form of inference known as inference to the best explanation. It's the, the only tool that we have that's going to get to the bottom of questions about unobserved causes. Um, so I'm on board with his method. I'll even accept his facts. Uh, so then the question is whether he's applying the method correctly, uh, given those facts. And, and that's where the, the, the two of us disagree. So let me, let me uh, first just make a distinction that, that Mike drew Im implicitly. I just want to make it more uh, explicit. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got two questions in front of us, uh, and I'll address each, I think. The, the first is uh, an inference of the best explanation involving as our evidence the, um, the, the reports from Jesus' followers and, and, and from Paul. And what we're now trying to do is infer the best explanation for, for why Jesus' followers and Paul made the reports that they did. The, the second kind of inference of the best explanation uh, it involves uh, Jesus' reappearance. So if we grant that Jesus did actually rise from the dead, I'm I'm not prepared to grant it, but let's let's just. So, well, I'm prepared to grant it. I don't believe it, but assuming he did really rise from the dead, we then have to ask how that was possible. And this is another way, another kind of inference we have to draw. Do we do we say that the best explanation for Jesus's reappearance was that uh, he's God, or God rose him, or or do we say something else? And um, I don't think uh, we're licensed in saying that that God is the cause, but let let me turn to the first the first um, bit of argument that Mike made. Here's what I regard as a more plausible explanation for why we have the reports from Paul and and uh, from Jesus uh, at the at the time um, that Jesus lived. People were much more superstitious and inclined to believe things that today we know to be false. There's a, a, a great book by a, a historian named Wendy Cotter who talks about the kinds of beliefs that people living in Jesus' day would have held. So um, a lot of them would have been would have believed the, the stories that 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 Homer re reported. Um, and, and I think that those stories are, are false. Uh, and, and I think there's no good reason to believe that that there are creatures like Skyland, Charybdis, and, and, and Sirens. Uh, and, and yet people did believe these things. People, people believed that um, Elijah had brought back to life a, a, a young son of uh, Zarephath's Zara widow. People also believed that... Um, uh, Elisha had cured leprosy. People believed that if you if you heaped abuse on a hobgoblin, it would cause the hobgoblin to run away. So so people living then didn't have the sophistication that people do today. And when you lack the kind of uh, education and scientific knowledge of the world that we have today, you're more likely to believe things. Uh, that, that are simply false. So, so my view is that Jesus was a very charismatic figure. He developed followers who perhaps within Jesus' lifetime came to believe that he was divine in some sort of way. Uh, he, he wouldn't be the, 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 the first person who had followers who uh, accepted their leader as divine. So Jesus had his group of... Um, followers, uh, many of them very zealous. And after his death, there was some event um, 
I can't tell you what it was, uh, but uh, word soon spread that Jesus hadn't actually died, or he had died actually, and, and he'd come back to life. And because people were superstitious and inclined to believe that these sorts of things were possible, the, uh, the news spread, was amplified, elaborated, and we have Christianity today as it is. Now, you'll notice I didn't say what that event was that might have inspired the claims of, of seeing Jesus, and I don't think it's really important that I provide those details. Those details are, are going to be hidden up from us forever, but, but the question I, I want to ask is, what's more plausible? Um, so what's the better explanation? If we're, if we're to accept the explanation that, that, that Mike wants us to accept, we have to believe that something contrary to physical law, something impossible in the literal sense of the wor word, happened. Okay, so, so one explanation for the testimony of, of Paul and Jesus' followers is that something extremely unlikely, impossible in fact, happened. Another explanation is the kind of explanation I gave, and the kind of explanation I gave trades on possibility. Things, things like what I described do happen. We get charismatic leaders who uh, inspire a great deal of enthusiasm and, and zealotry from their followers, and, and these followers end up spinning tales about events that didn't actually occur because of what might be naivete, might be uh, a, uh, a simple desire to believe. So it seems that, seems that my explanation, which is consistent with what we know about the world, should be preferred to, to Mike's, which is inconsistent with what we know about the world. Um, and if you put them on a par, it, it just seems that mine is much more plausible explanation. So Mike, Larry's saying there then that happy, he's happy with your method, happy even with your facts, but the conclusion can't have happened because it's not a possible thing to have happened. And so anything that Larry could posit is to be preferred because the, well, that's possible and, and feasible. So we'll let you come back on that. Okay. Well, he talked about how some people back then were more superstitious than us in our you know more sophisticated, educated society. But hey, I agree with that. But, you know, um, that would assume that the site that everybody was superstitious, that the disciples of Jesus, uh, that Paul was was superstitious. And, and we don't know that. But even if they were, one could be superstitious and the events still happen and they recognize it. So that's one thing I'd say. I'd also say that today some people are superstitious. So we've got fake news. We got people who uh, believe fake news. We have um people who have crystals and horoscopes and um and, and things like that um you have not and not everybody who believes that miracles and the supernatural things occur today are superstitious i mean i've seen medical doctors people with medical doctorates who say they have experienced the supernatural or seen a miracle happen with one of their patients uh, Dale Allison is a friend of mine. He, he's a, he teaches New Testament at Princeton. He is not an evangelical, and he'll tell you that he has experienced the supernatural. Um, he's got a highly educated guy here. He's one of the top New Testament scholars in the world, and yet um, he will will say that he has experienced this kind of stuff. So you have very highly educated people who will say that they have experienced it. Um, he will say, uh, Larry said that there was some event happened. He acknowledges that some event happened that they interpreted as the risen Jesus appearing to them. But notice he, he says, well, I, I don't know what that event is. And he says, it, it's not important. Uh, well, I, I think it is important. It, you know, the whole purpose of, a, of doing a historical investigation here is to formulate a hypothesis and then to weigh that hypothesis to see which is the best one. So, um, when you say, well, X happened, and, but I'm not going to define that further. Well, you're really not saying much about what your hypothesis is. And so it's hard to compare the two because you're not even really stating what the one is. Um, he talks about something being elaborated. Well, yeah, um, 
you could have an event that was somewhat elaborated uh, or amplified. Like, let's say the feeding of the 5,000. What if there was only 1,000 there and it turned into 5,000? I'm not saying that's what happened, but if it, it still was a, a pretty miraculous event. And sometimes when something big happens, over the years, we do tend to amplify it. That can happen in our memories, but it doesn't mean that that pretty cool event actually happened. Um, so then he says, plausible. What's more plausible? That Jesus was raised from the dead uh, or that something else happened because the resurrection would be contrary to physical or natural law. Well, natural law and physical law is the laws of nature are formed to tell us what typically occurs in our world when it's left to itself. Um, so for example, I, I got a pen here that I use to take some notes. Now, if I drop that pen, the law of gravity, natural law is going to say that pen's going to drop. And I could do the same exercise a million times over and you're going to have the same thing. But now I want to show you something really, really amazing. You ready for this? This is going to be a jaw dropper for you. I'm ready, you ready? Mike. Watch this. I'm ready. <sighs> Whoa, it didn't drop. Well, why not? Because my hand entered the scenario and altered the normal course of events. So what a miracle is, it's not a violation of the laws of nature. It's not a suspension of the laws of nature. It's when the hand of God enters our world and alters the normal course of events so that nature was not left to itself. Um, so I, I, if God exists and wanted to raise Jesus from the dead, the God who created the universe, who put the natural laws in place, who created life, I mean, um, something like the resurrection and bringing someone back to life when he created life out of non-life doesn't seem to me that that would be a problem. And again, when, when, when you're saying, what is X? What is X that led them to believe Jesus rose from the dead? Well, it wasn't a hallucination. If Larry wants to posit that, we, we can discuss that. It wasn't a hallucination. They, they weren't lying about it. And it wasn't a legend that developed over time because it's the original disciples that are claiming this. So you got to say, well, what is it? And you start to eliminate all these, but yet the resurrection hypothesis still explains all these things well, whereas what Larry has presented lacks explanatory power because he can't define what X is. I can tell you what X is. I can make up a bunch of different Xs. Here are some Xs. Okay. We could say that um, Jesus' followers thought the best way to preserve Jesus's message and legacy was to make up a story about his resurrection. Okay, so now we have two hypotheses. One is that some people working together collaborated. Maybe they, they also got Paul in on the action. Maybe they bribed Paul and they wove this story. Okay, so that's one explanation. And again, we know things like that happen. History is full of uh, instances of people making up stories for various purposes. Some purposes might be uh, uh, malevolent, uh, some might be beneficent, but what, whatever the motivation, people do make up stories. And it seems to me far more plausible that a story was made up about Jesus' resurrection than that a person actually died and actually came back to life. Okay. My, my response to that would be, um, yeah, those things do happen, but then wouldn't that be the first thing that Paul, who was persecuting the church, would have expected? It seems like it would have been. Bribing Paul? Remember, Paul was a committed Pharisee who was zealous for the church, and he, uh, by his own testimony in an undisputed letter of Paul, he said um, that, you know, he's presenting his own testimony in Philippians. He says, uh, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew's Jew, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Oh, okay. How much How much did you say you'd give me if I uh, do that? And then all of a sudden he's out there and he becomes the persecuted. Um, and, and he's thrown in prison. He's beaten. Um, he's stoned and eventually martyred for proclaiming the, the message that he wants uh, 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 about the Christ that, and the movement that he wants uh, persecuted. Um, and then the disciples uh, who had followed Jesus, if they were doing this for a legacy, you might expect them to accept some persecution, but 
all of them. Uh, I mean, this isn't just a matter of they were calling them names and making them fun of it. I mean, they they suffered physical abuse, hardships in life, and at least several of them experienced martyrdom, and the rest of them were willing to experience martyrdom after seeing their colleagues uh, suffer that way. So um, I, I don't think that that's plausible. Well, we're going to get into more of that in the third section. We do need to take another quick break. But again, it's just wonderful. I hope uh, viewers and listeners agree with me that it's fantastic to have two people of opposing views speaking in such a, a friendly manner and with such background knowledge as well. And we've been really treated so far, haven't we? Because in the first section, we had Detective Larry Shapiro and his uh, murder mystery. We've had Magic Mike Lacona in part two with his disappearing pen trick. And if you're not watching it on YouTube, you really, I mean, you won't believe your eyes. Uh, seeing is believing. Um, and we're going to talk about that and hallucination um, hypotheses in the final part of the show. But we are talking here on Unbelievable about the resurrection. Did it happen? I've been joined by uh, two academics, two theologians, Mike Lacona and Larry Shapiro. I'm your host, Andy Kite. We'll be back after this short break, but do let us know what you think. We want to get your uh, questions answered in future shows. So email us, unbelievable at premier.org.uk at Unbelievable FE on Twitter and at Premier Unbelievable on Instagram and Facebook. We'll be back very shortly for part three. I, I would ask Tom this, and this is a, a surprising question maybe, to nominate for me one thing, just one thing, that Christianity has introduced that doesn't have some source, some parallel, some analogy in, in previous and in other civilizations. The ideal of, of lifelong uh, matrimony, I think that's a, a very distinctive Christian concept. I think the, the category of, of what by the 19th century is coming to be categorized as, as homosexuality and heterosexuality, I think they have no precedence. I think the notion of secularism, the idea of there being religions, I think all these are entirely exclusive to uh, Christian civilization. I think the concept of science as it emerges in the 19th century, I think is entirely exclusive to, uh, to, to, to Christian civilization. I think the idea that um, human beings are created in the image of God, that is obviously something Christian and share with uh, with Jews it gives a degree of dignity to human beings that no other cultural tradition that I'm aware of even remotely approximates. Welcome back to part three of this unbelievable show. Did it really happen? We're looking at the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, I've been joined by Magic Mike Lacona and Detective Larry Shapiro. Uh, you'll have needed to listen to the first two parts to understand what I mean. But we're having a fantastic uh, conversation. It's friendly. It's erudite. It's not esoteric. And uh, in this uh, final section, we want to drill a little bit deeper and uh, go a little bit wider. So we've been looking at the evidence for the resurrection what i wanted to know um mike from you is how much does one's worldview sort of pre-existing worldview impact how you see the resurrection and how sort of uh, convincing it might be for instance is it more likely for someone to go from a sort of general theism to christianity when looking at the resurrection or is it more common for someone to be an atheist and go straight to Christianity based on that historical evidence? What, from your experience, what's the more likely sort of journey there? Oh, I don't know what would be more common, but I would think there would be a shorter step to go from a general form of theism. You believe God exists, but you don't know who it is. Uh, to go from there to believing Jesus rose from the dead than it would be from being an atheist to believing Jesus rose from the dead. Great. And what we want to do is, on Unbelievable, is not just have uh, slanging matches. And uh, as we said, this is, this is a corker. But we like to be able to steel man the opposition. So, Mike, what is, in your opinion, the, the strongest case against the resurrection? Obviously, it's not a, it's not a view that you hold to, but um, what's the strongest case against the resurrection? I, I don't know, Andy. Um, 
I've, you know, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful to Larry in any sense. I just don't find any of the arguments against it to be that persuasive. And I, he probably doesn't find the arguments for the resurrection to be persuasive. But if, if, if one thing I've wondered about recently is, you know, let, let's say the evidence, the strength of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is, is X. We'll just call it X, however you want to quantify it. And I, I'll, I'll acknowledge, I, I don't, I don't like Islam. I'm not only persuaded, not persuaded by the, the supporting data for it, but I, I don't like it. Now, if if Islam was true, then I'd want to become a Muslim. I don't have to like Allah, but I'd worship him because I fear him. Um, I don't think the evidence for Islam is good. I think it's one of the most easily refuted religions in the world. But let so let's just say the evidence for Islam is just entirely lacking. Um, now, and the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is X. Now, let's just say you swap them, and the evidence for the truth of Islam was X, and the evidence for the resurrection was was Y, uh, or just lacking. Would the would X be enough to persuade me to come to become an, an a Muslim? And I've never really given that serious thought. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be. So I, I would say that if what what's maybe the strongest evidence or argument against the resurrection might be, well, there there just isn't enough evidence t to persuade me. Um, that that might be what I would say. I I, I like the way Mike framed that, uh, as assigning some value to the the um, the nature of the evidence uh, and. This brings me to a, a point I, I haven't yet made, and and that is, um, let, let's look at an, an, another case. This time, I won't ask Mike his opinion; I'll just assert my own. Let's 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 imagine we have a uh, an eight year old girl. We'll call her Sally, who provides us with evidence in the form of testimony. And uh, one day, she comes home from school and says that there is a, a fire alarm, and we have to ask whether to believe what she reports. Our evidence is her testimony. And, and we think fire alarms, these are the sorts of things that happen pretty frequently or not too infrequently. So yeah, we, we believe her. And uh, the next day Sally comes home and uh, um, tells us that uh, a, a bunch of dinosaurs had run through the hall of the school. Okay, now Sally today is just as reliable as she was the day before. Uh, you know, let's suppose her testimony is correct 99% of the time. Okay, so that's the, the X that Mike is talking about. And yet, when she reports the dinosaur stores running through the hall, we don't believe her. And that's because it's not that her, her testimony is less reliable, it's that what she's reporting on is so... Uh, so incredibly unlikely. So the, the, the point is, the value of evidence varies given what it is purporting to, to show. And so, so when I hear Mike's evidence for belief in the resurrection, one thing I ask myself is, how good is that evidence given what it's trying to establish? So we have evidence of the Civil War in the United States of America. It's very good evidence, and on the basis of this evidence, um, we believe that there's a civil war. I think that um, because the resurrection is such an improbable event, we should need evidence for it even stronger than the evidence that we have for the civil war. Uh, and I think Mike would agree we don't. Our evidence is is, is not that good. Mike? Well, yeah. Well, I, I do. Th it may not be as good as it is that the civil war, you know, actually occurred. But if you're looking at ancient events, it, it is pretty good. I mean, just compare it with Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. Now, we have approximately nine ancient sources that mention the Rubicon crossing within 300 years of the event, somewhere around nine sources. And only four of those sources were composed within 100 years of the event. And half of those don't even mention the Rubicon crossing directly. It just says, well, Caesar was at this part, and then he was in a Riminum later on. Um, and Julius Caesar doesn't even mention the Rubicon crossing uh, explicitly. 
So uh, that that is what you have there. And in some of those sources, they even mention supernatural events and they embellish things and they have some some errors in them. So um, that's what we have for the Rubicon crossing. But let's suppose the evidence for the resurrection is as good as the evidence for Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. The problem is people cross rivers all the time. When we hear that someone crossed a river, we don't think, wow, we're going to need a lot of evidence to establish that. But someone rising from the dead, that that seems more unusual than crossing a river. And so we should demand even stronger evidence. Well, I, certainly additional evidence, um, I would think. So the evidence that I would put in there would be, again, some things that uh, there's a universal consensus amongst critical scholars today. So they agree that Jesus came on the scene, believing that he had been chosen by God to usher in his kingdom, that he taught in parables, that he performed deeds that astonished crowds, and that many regarded as divine miracles and exorcisms, uh, that he was crucified on the orders of Pontius Pilate at the instigation of the Jewish leadership, and that shortly thereafter, a number of his followers had these experiences they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus to them. And that also included uh, groups and uh, not universal, but mostly. And then um, also Paul, uh, who had persecuted the church. You put all that together within that kind of a background. Well, that makes a difference. So it'd be kind of like what you said about Sally saying she saw dinosaurs. What if there was, uh, uh, you know, if that was just the total context, uh, then we'd say, well, that'd be that 1%. You said she's 99% trustworthy. Well, that'd be the 1% um, that we, you know, she'd be unreliable. But, but if, all, if, if you add it to that context, that, um, that something like Jurassic Park was also true, um, that they had been able to bring from DNA and whatever in amber or whatever, they'd been able to create some dinosaurs. And then all of a sudden, you get some reports from the local zoo or something that some of these dinosaurs had escaped. Well, then things start to look more probable that Sally was telling the truth that she saw dinosaurs. Yeah, that's that's true. But we don't want to assume that, it, you know, if, if, if we assume that there are dinosaurs, then then then, of course, um, uh, it makes her story more likely. But. We're, we, we can't just assume Jesus did actually rise from the dead because that's that's what we're trying to establish with our inference to the best explanation. Right, which I, I hadn't in the context that I just mentioned. So, Mike, then, is the resurrection and the evidence for the resurrection, does that work best as part of a cumulative case for Christ when you add in teleology and objective morality and the concept of beauty and, and the arts. Is that how you think it is best presented as maybe the final step in a cumulative case? Um, or do you think actually, no, just on its own, we can look at this evidence for the resurrection and we can say that the resurrection is the, is the, is the best example, is the best case for the evidence we've got. What do you, what do you think? How do you think it works best in apologetics? Um, well, an apologetic. Well, as a historian here, I, I'm not so much concerned with apologetics when I'm acting as a historian. I'm just saying, as a historian, you look at the data and it's like, well, the data points to the resurrection of Jesus. You could reject it on theological or philosophical grounds, of course, uh, like Larry would do it on philosophical grounds. But you know, if you're looking at it purely historically, it does seem to point to the resurrection of Jesus, especially if you come at it from a you know an open position, not assuming God's existence or a priori excluding it. Now, that said, um, if you want to go ahead as an apologist and you want to add some thing, additional things to it, such as um, the arguments for a first cause of everything or a designer of the universe and life or uh, the existence of objective moral values, um, or you add some things about Jesus that aren't accepted by uh, you know, nearly a universal consensus, but still by a, a, a significant number, such as Jesus predicted his imminent death and subsequent resurrection, or that he claimed to be God's uniquely divine son. Well, you know, all of those things can strengthen an overall case for the resurrection or the truth of Christianity, of course. Great. Larry, anything to uh, jump in on there? Well, I'll I'll, I'll repeat something I, I said before, and then I'll um, raise a different issue. They, they, 
the, the challenge that, that Mike faces, and I think it's a challenge he, he faces more, more than I do because the, the burden of proof falls on someone who, um, who asserts that Jesus really did rise from the dead, given that that is, is an event uh, of a sort that is incredibly unlikely. And, and so I'm, I'm in a strategically easier position, I think, than Mike is because I'm willing to entertain a number of hypotheses for why uh, we have the testimony following his death that we do that are all consistent with the way that we know the world to work. Uh, now, now Mike can say, as, as he did with his, his, his magic trick with the, the pen, he, he can say, well, the world works a certain way and, and until it doesn't when, when, when God intervenes in that world. But that introduces a new kind of inference. It's, we're assuming that uh, God is existing and explaining this, this event. And when, when Mike talked initially about why he dismissed my, uh, my alien explanation for the dead mouse, if I can return to my, my mystery story, he quite correctly pointed out a number of assumptions that made the alien explanation not a good one. That, and th- these assumptions involved things like the distance of uh, the nearest extraterrestrial life, the amount of time it would take them to travel here. And those are, are testable assumptions. We, we can measure these things. We know how to do that. But if we're to accept that God is doing the kinds of things that Mike says God is doing, we need to know that God intended to do those things, that God desired to do those things. Uh, and those are assumptions that we don't know how to test. So, so that makes it difficult. The other thing I want to respond to is um, both of your assumptions that God is somehow uh, what makes subjective morality possible. I, I take objective morality to be this idea that there's a fact of the matter about which actions are are morally correct and which are are, are not, but but Plato showed a long time ago that that uh, this this doesn't work, uh, and Plato's example came from uh, the the dialogue he wrote called the Euthyphro, in in which he pointed out that we don't think that God is the kind of being who would do terrible things, allow terrible things to happen. Uh, so, so God um, would not uh, endorse killing, let's say, needless killing. And then the question is, why would God not endorse needless killing? And the answer is because killing is wrong. Um, and that's why God would not permit needless killing. So the objective objectivity of morality, if it is objective, precedes God's uh, dicta. So so, I, so I, that's just a point about whether we can look at objective morality as, as evidence for God's existence. It goes the other way, I think. And presumably, Mark, you would want to come back and say God commands things because he is good. Something is, is right or wrong because of the nature of God, which sort of splits the horns of the dilemma, doesn't it? Yeah, that, I would say that it, morality, it's objective. Uh, Ed, it, something isn't good because God can, said it's good. Um, and goodness does not exist apart from God. Like if God doesn't exist, then morals aren't objective. Uh, there's no reason to think that if there were no living beings at all, uh, if there were no humans, that there would be morality. I mean, in the animal kingdom, Ducks rape each other. Uh, there's theft of food, and we don't look at that as morally good or evil. It's just it just is. It's the animal kingdom. So if humans didn't, if God doesn't exist, then objective moral values don't exist. Uh, uh, morality, objective morals, that is, would be grounded in the character of God. But in terms of a couple other things that Larry said, he says uh, resurrection would be incredibly unlikely. Um, I'd be curious to know why he would think it'd be so unlikely. I would say, agree with him. It's incredibly unlikely by natural causes. But if God exists and wanted to raise Jesus, well, then, of course, it's amazingly likely. It's it's certain. Um, so then he said about the intent. We'd have to know 
that God would intend to raise Jesus before you could say it's plausible. So I, it, how about this? Astronomers see a comet and they know it's going to collide with the moon on a certain day. And at that time, there you got the Hubble Space Telescope and some planetariums who that are zoomed in on the lunar surface. And when the comet slams into the moon and the lunar dust settles, there's a message written on the moon's surface and it says, Jesus is Lord. And it's written in, in Hebrew and in Greek. Now, a scientist could look at that and of course could say, wow, I have no plausible explanation for that. Um, I, I Certainly it would seem to require a miracle. Um, I have no tools as a scientist to be able to say that God did it, but it still happened. So I don't have to know that God intended for it to happen, that that was intent to communicate that message. I don't have to know ahead of time that God exists. The evidence itself would show that the event itself occurred. I just wouldn't be able to say something as a scientist about the cause. Now, on my off hours, I might say, yeah, it looks like God exists. But I couldn't prove that as a scientist, as an astronomer. I think the same thing applies to, say, the resurrection of Jesus. We could apply arguments of inference to the best explanation, historical inquiry. We could conclude that Jesus rose from the dead, the historian could, and just say, but as a historian, I just don't have the tools to say the cause of that event. Now, maybe on my off hours, I could say it sure looks like God, but um, I still, within my rights as a historian, I could say the event itself occurred and just leave the cause of the event undetermined. Larry? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I, th I think we're we're agreeing. Um, if Jesus did rise from the dead, uh, I would still not feel epistemically justified. That is, I would not feel as if I had the evidence I needed to pronounce on what explains his, his resurrection, uh, and that's because it could be any number of things. And some some causes we'll just never know about. Uh, so so g given that it could be any number of things that explain his resurrection, I don't see why one should settle on God as the, the most plausible explanation. Well, I mean, that, of course, would be a separate discussion. But for me, I'd say if Jesus comes on the scene and he claims to be chosen by God to usher in his, his kingdom, if he does claim, as I think he did, to claim to be God's uniquely divine son, and then he is performing deeds that astonish his crowds, whether or not you regard them as divine miracles would be a different thing. But even skeptical scholars acknowledge that he he astonished crowds with the things that he did. Um, you know, I, I look at those things, his claims and his deeds, and it seems like, well, the resurrection hypothesis or the, the hypothesis that that God raised Jesus would certainly be plausible. Um, I, I think it'd be better than something than say an, an alien in a parallel universe uh, raised him since that would be entirely ad hoc. Whereas the hypothesis that God raised Jesus would not be ad hoc given if you acknowledge that Jesus claimed to be God's uniquely divine son, that he did these astonishing deeds, etc. I think the context makes God raising Jesus more plausible than some of the other ones. But that would be a separate discussion, of course. It would. And I think we need to have that discussion as well. But we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I want to give you both a chance to uh, close with some thoughts, maybe recap something you feel needs to be reiterated. Larry, we'll start with you, sir. Yes. Fine. Um, well, what we have, uh, as far as evidence goes for the resurrection, is testimony from people who... Um, we're not as aware of how the world works as as we are. We we look at a a, a, a star in the sky and we see a, a, a nuclear reactor of some sorts. They 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 didn't see that. We we look at a whale and we see a mammal. Uh, they, they they saw a fish. Uh, we 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 look at the sun moving down uh, on the horizon and 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 we see the Earth's motion. They they saw the sun's motion. So we're, we're dealing with people who didn't see the world the way we see it today, and their perception of the world was was less accurate than our own perception of the world. 
and we're faced with an account of something that is uh, simply not possible, someone's dead being risen again, and we have to ask, what's the best explanation for this testimony that these people provided for us? And it seems to me that any number of explanations can be uh, in invented, we're not going to know which one actually occurred, that are more plausible than God's actually intervening in some way to 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 raise Jesus from the dead. That's that's the uh, the view I take on, on the issue. Thanks, Larry. And Mike, just closing thoughts from you, please. Yeah, well, I, I do think that when you look at the facts, um, those things that are so strongly supported by the data that overwhelming majority of critical scholars are willing to grant them as facts, um, the resurrection hypothesis, it, when you use Arguments of inference to the best explanation. I, I contend that, at least as a historical investigation, it is by far the best explanation of those historical bedrock and and the widely agreed upon facts. Um, yeah, I agree with Larry that the ancients did not understand the world like we do today through scientific knowledge. But you don't have to 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 be a physician or a philosopher or a biblical scholar or detective or whatever, or a magician, uh, to be able to understand that if you see a guy that has been scourged to the bone and then crucified, and then a few days later, you see this person in perfect health. Um, and it, shockingly, you know, you see him, it, it doesn't take a professional to be able to say, this guy's been raised from the dead. Um, I think the resurrection is by far the best explanation of this. And um, it's not possible by natural causes, but again, if God exists and wanted to raise Jesus, well, then of course it's possible, it's probable, it's certain. So I think it's a responsibility of us to be able to look at the data and permit the data to challenge what we think is possible. So I don't think it's possible that an alien has visited earth but you know of as of recently the u.s government seems to acknowledge that there are some ufos and um if all of a sudden um i start to see a lot of testimonies more testimonies that seem credible of people saying they saw aliens and then all of a sudden we're we're really seeing alien sightings that are brought up by various governments and they're showing videos of it around the world then i'm going to have to think that well, maybe these civilizations, which you know, they found some technology that I didn't think was possible ahead of time, I've got to allow the data to challenge my current assumptions. And I think we have to do that with something like the resurrection as well. To subscribe to the Socratic Oath and to follow the evidence where it leads, Mike. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much to both of my guests, Dr. Mike Lacona and Dr. Larry Shapiro. It's been absolutely amazing to have you both on. And you have uh, displayed and demonstrated once again that even with big topics like this, it's possible to have a friendly joust and not just a bar brawl. Uh, quite the tussle, a few cuts and bruises maybe, but both <laughs> opponents leaving with their honour and dignity intact to fight another day. Uh, let us know what you think uh, of the show. Please rate and review on the platform you're listening or watching. And please do, in your comments, model the chivalry of Mike and Larry towards one another. On behalf of the whole team here and me, Andy Kind, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you join us. Please let us know what you think. Email us, unbelievable, at premier.org.uk. We are on Twitter, formerly, sorry, <laughs> we are on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Unbelievable FE, on Instagram, at Premier Unbelievable, and Facebook.com forward slash Premier Unbelievable. Join us again for more discussions and debates in the same vein. And until then, take care and all the best. <laughs>